vous présente notre prochain invité, our next guest, Professor Henry Minsberg, qui est aujourd'hui euh, avec nous grâce au soutien du EMBA McGill et de HEC Montréal. Bonjour à vous, euh, professeur. Euh, C'est une référence internationale dans le domaine de la sociologie des organisations. Vous avez peut-être déjà lu certains de ses livres ou de ses articles. Il en a publié plusieurs. Les modèles qu'il a élaborés permettent de mieux comprendre le fonctionnement des organisations, si tant est que les organisations soient un jour vraiment compréhensibles. Professor in the Deshotel Faculty of Management at McGill University in Montreal, Mr. Minsberg has been described in many ways throughout his career as influencer, innovator, Iconoclast. Which one of these uh, three would you like, or do you like best? I Iconic? guess icon Iconoclast. Iconoclast? Why is that? I'll take them all. I'll take them all. Very good. Uh, <laughs> but you were just telling me about your, your tombstone. I thought the story was rather funny. <laughs> And what you'd like to see there? Well, I was interviewed. I, I was once interviewed. We had trouble setting it up, so we had to do it at 7.30 in the morning coming off a plane at Heathrow from Montreal. So I was kind of groggy. And he was asking me about competition among these so-called gurus, and there must be a lot of competition. Are you one? Uh, Guru? No, I don't like the term. I'm a, I'm a swami. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and I said, I, I really never felt any competition at all. It's just not an issue for me. And then I blurted this out, which sounds arrogant, but I don't think it is. I said, I never set out to be the best. It's too low a standard. I set out to be good. And uh, so that's what, that'd be nice on my tombstone. I'll settle for good. In about uh, another 30 years or so. Very good. Uh, we at least have an hour to, to be good here on stage. Um, just a reminder, uh, en français et en anglais, si vous voulez, une fois encore, nous envoyer des questions, des gazouillis via uh, Twitter, if you want to send your questions, uh, we will still be uh, tweeting with you today. So uh, questions will appear on our screen here, and later on, uh, we'll just uh, raise whatever issues with Professor Minsberg. Yes? Et est-ce que je peux répondre en anglais shakespearean? Of course, we would appreciate your best Shakespearean English. <laughs> okay. um, first of all, I was talking about, uh, briefly about your background. Um, wanted to start by hearing uh, what you had to say on the state of affairs in the business world. Uh, there is a sense today that the worst of what we've seen in 2007 and 8 is gone, that everything is back to normal, or on the way back to normal, where I get the feeling that in fact it's a huge failure and we haven't quite seen the end of it. Yeah, let, let me qualify that because, because it's a big world um, and I don't think Canada uh, has, has suffered hugely the way uh, the US has or China or lots of other, Brazil. There are lots of countries that aren't suffering that way. The problem is in the United States. This is a made in America problem, and it's not just because of the mortgages. I don't think this is at its root a mortgage problem or a finance problem or an economics problem. They keep trying to fix it through economic policy. It's not an economic problem, it's a management problem. Too many American enterprises have been horribly depreciated by just plain bad management, and call it leadership, because it's been leadership disconnected from management. Um, look at the bonuses, for example. Any, any chief executive who accepts these huge bonuses uh, that, that separates them so much from everybody else in the company is not a leader. By definition, they're not a leader. How can you lead when you're, when you're willing to accept being so singled out in the enterprise? So the leadership has been horribly lacking. There are exceptions. Apple is doing brilliantly and so on. Uh, but there are too many American companies that are in terrible shape right now. Uh, I was speaking to somebody a couple of days ago in the airline business, and he was talking about how the different airlines are rated, you know, the ratings of the world's best airlines, and apparently American airlines just don't figure much They're in not those there, ratings. No. No. And that's typical of many industries. In entertainment, in, uh, in, uh, in, in things like that, the U.S. does fine. But in a lot of industries, it's failing terribly. I, I grasp the nuance when you say, well, you know, Canada has not been uh, damaged as much as uh, American corporations, or in China, it's not the same. But still, uh, they do have a huge influence on Absolutely. the way we're doing things. Sure. Uh, so it's sure. not only in America or in the US, but the, the US model has been exported throughout yeah. the world. Yeah. And we live with it here in Canada as well. 
Yeah, I'm actually surprised that the Canadian economy didn't. I thought that no matter how sensible we may have remained, and our banks remain sensible, for example, I thought we'd really be dragged much farther down by the U.S. economy more than we have been, and like our unemployment, for example. Uh, it seems to me that it's also uh, severely a crisis of leadership. You were uh, talking about it, and I guess it is of a great interest for the people in this room. Um, to what extent have we uh, globally, or at least in the U.S., missed the point about what being a good leader is? Well, I think there's much too much hype about leadership uh, and much too much attention on leadership. Not that leadership isn't important. Show me a leader, I'll show you a bunch of followers. Do we want organizations that have nothing but followers? Um, uh, if you, uh, I once saw a, a, a thing on television uh, building a big dam in India and there were 100,000 people carrying rocks on their head and dropping it onto the dam, uh, you know, carrying the rocks. That, that's not the place for participative management. <laughs> Um, but but in a, in where you're dealing with knowledge workers and intelligent people, uh, you don't want a bunch of followers. You want people who grab the initiative and so on. So you don't want all this leadership sucked up to the chief executive. What you call the inflated sense of the CEO, which has been prevailing in the last, what, 15, 20 years, or maybe yeah. longer than that. How do you change a culture? Because it's seriously ingrained in the culture of the businesses throughout the world. You're looking at the leader as the hero. Yeah, yeah, this hero worshiping is, is horrible. I, I think you want to have uh, people in leadership positions uh, who are, uh, there, there was, when Bolton was, was uh, appointed or wanted to be appointed by uh, Bush as the UN guy, they described them as a kiss up and kick down sort of guy. How do you get kiss up and kick down sort of guys? Very simple, the people who are getting kissed do the selection. And the people who are getting kicked have no say <laughs> in the selection. In, in other words, we, we rarely, in the case of chief executives or any managers, we rarely get the voice of the people who know the candidates best, namely the ones who have been managed by them. If, if, you, if you really want to know someone, I suggest you either marry them or work for them. Uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> Which is the worst? <laughs> <laughs> It depends. <laughs> <laughs> that is the politically right way to answer yeah, that yeah. one. But, but, but uh, when you work for them, you get to know their faults. And so if you're selecting a chief executive or any manager, get the voice. I'm not saying elect the person. I'm saying get the voice of the people who know them best. And the people who know them best are the ones who work for them. How many boards really tap into that kind of knowledge when they choose the chief executive? So they'll often choose someone who can impress outsiders, uh, but is, is dismal on the inside. Now, there's one very famous company. It's probably represented in this room, but everybody in this room knows this company. It's been hugely successful for decades. The leader in its industry, no question. Okay, and, and, and it selects its chief executive by a closed vote of, a, of its senior manager to a three-year term. Rarely does anybody guess who it is. It's McKinsey and Company. The McKinsey chief executive is, is elected by the senior management to a three-year term. The senior management meaning the senior partners to a three-year term. I wonder how often McKinsey has made that recommendation to its own clients. Okay, it works for McKinsey, it works brilliantly. From McKinsey. And you know who you're voting for, indeed, because you had work experience. You know the people, you know the candidates. You, you run the risk of trying to elect someone who's not going to ruffle your feathers. That's always a problem. That's why I say I wouldn't necessarily elect chief executives, but I'd get the voice of people who know the candidates. To what extent the crisis we're going through is a function of the model that has been implemented by business schools in North America? Uh, and I'm not pointing at you directly at McGill, but uh, if it's such a failure, I guess business schools have a responsibility. What are we not teaching right? No, no, the business schools have been perfect in this. Of course. <laughs> a lot of people probably in this room came from the same business schools we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does it mean that they are, they were not properly trained? Yeah. Uh, the problem for me is in the, is in the conventional MBA programs. MBA programs for young people 
who have no, no or very little man, managerial experience. The BCom, the bachelor's programs are fine because they, they don't go out with all these pretensions. Uh, but in the MBA, people have the impression that they're trained to be managers. Everybody should be stamped as they come out with a skull and crossbones, the pirate flag, with the words, warning, not prepared to manage. Uh, because... <laughs> you mean... <laughs> that certainly resonates well here. But that doesn't mean they can't learn to manage. It simply means that they haven't been trained to manage in a classroom because you can't create a manager in a classroom or a leader. You can't create a manager or a leader in a classroom. It's, it's not possible. Management is a practice. It's learned on the job. What you can do in the classroom is bring in people who are managers and get them reflecting and learning from each other on their own experience. And I can talk about that later. But, but, but you can't create a manager in a classroom. So anybody who graduates in an MBA program, a regular MBA, young people I call teeny bopper MBA programs, uh, uh, who think they're prepared to manage are a danger in society. Uh, now, now, if, uh, now, what the MBA does brilliantly is train people in the business functions. Marketing, finance, accounting, those sorts of things. It does that well. And if that's what you want to learn, if that's what you realize you have learned, and then you uh, join a, you know, uh, become an analyst on Wall Street or become a marketing researcher or whatever, that's fine. Uh, just as long as you realize that if you're going to be a manager, you're going to have to learn how to be a manager. 